A barter in my mind is you say, I make a great cake. He says, I make an amazing pizza. You say to him, you know what? I'll make you a cake, you make me a pizza, right? That's a barter. You think it's gonna take you both the same amount of hours and charge the same amount for exactly that? No, but I never expected it to take the same amount of time. But that's what you're arguing here. I there was nothing set forth here other than you do this and I'll do that. And we're here with two people now who are contending that neither party finished the the jobs they needed to do. do you guys I don't have any other questions after that. I don't see any evidence of the agreement as they have both discussed it in this courtroom today. It's like, oh, this was all new to me. So if it's new to me because it's not alleged in the papers, then it's clear that they did not have this agreement from the outset. What seems to me here, if we take them each as credible and as each of them as confused as they were, then we have to find that the plaintiff did all but the two jobs he was supposed to do, and the defendant did everything but finish the two tasks. And so basically, they're both at a loss, and they both should be awash, and we should just dismiss the cases. No, I, I don't agree. The no? plaintiff contracted for a job, an end product, and the barter, we can't analyze bartering situations on the basis of hours, unless it's specifically detailed in an agreement. We have to analyze bartering agreements on the end object of the bartering agreement. The plaintiff said the end object of my responsibilities pursuant to this bartering was to build this man a uh, framing and he shows us a photograph of it. The defendant's end object was to weld these two things together. The plaintiff, I believe, did what he was supposed to do and therefore the defendant is liable for the completion of the remainder of the job he bartered for. So that would mean that he should get the material. Why should the defendant benefit from $1,500 worth of material that the plaintiff purchased to do the job and for the work that he put in? He's asking for $3,000. I think he deserves it. So, according to the papers and the testimony, the defendant says that there were two other jobs. The plaintiff admits that he did one of those other jobs. There was a project that the defendant wanted done that the plaintiff didn't complete. No, there were four jobs, remember? The two four that he total. Did, four total, uh, right. The two that he did, plus two more that he didn't do. Yeah. My point on all of this is that if we're this unclear, then there can't be an, an agreement. I don't think they've proven right. an agreement. Right. We are too confused. Yeah, and we're never and so, confused. <laughs> So, so do you th like, don't you think he's entitled to at least the money that the materials that I he paid for? I think that because there was such a lack of clarity, the plaintiffs ripping up the check may have been indicative of we weren't sure. I just want to be done with it. The most I would consider giving him that sixteen hundred dollars because the defendant was prepared to pay it before. I don't think they have an agreement, and I feel uh, like we're, we're ripping uh, our heads I, I would, out. I would go along with giving him back his sixteen hundred. No, no, but let me just say about the sixteen hundred. I think that he caused himself to incur the additional expense by not taking the fifteen hundred and paying the lumber yard immediately. That extra hundred and some odd dollars was really a result of the plaintiff's oh, own point. actions. That's a so, great point. So Absolutely. I'd go with the fifteen hundred but not with the 16, whatever it was, except that I'm actually more comfortable just dismissing both. If you're not going to do it, I think I might be dissenting and going with the dismissal of each of theirs. They bought it. It was a transaction at arm's length. The defendant misassessed the entire job that he had to do. And that goes back to, Michael, your position that you can't do an hour-to-hour -hour thing. And it goes back to your position that there was no agreement. But I'm not prepared to deny the plaintiff the, the money that he spent for the materials that the defendant benefited. You know, I think I'm going to flip again. I really want to hold fast to the idea of just making them whole on an equitable basis. I'd give the plaintiff back the money for the materials. I would dismiss the balance. Okay, so I'm going to dissent because I would dismiss both of theirs. I, I just think that everybody's even. Well, the three of us had a meeting of the minds on one issue, and that is that neither of you had a meeting of the minds, which is why there was so much confusion here. We are a divided court. I dissented from the verdict in that I felt because there was no meeting of the minds and the confusion that I felt, that meant, sir, that you didn't meet your burden on your direct case and that, sir, you didn't meet yours on your counterclaim. And so I would dismiss both cases and let you walk on your way. But my colleagues took it from a different perspective and saw that you were, sir, actually out of pocket $1,500. You were actually out of pocket $1,624, but that was partially your fault. 
you would have been out of pocket 1500 had you taken the check from the defendant in the first instance. But since you laid out $1,500 for the cost of the materials, they are willing to reimburse you for the money that you laid out. With regard to the actual barter agreement itself, I think we're all on the same page. You were an arm's length transaction and you can't do dollar for dollar in a situation like this. So, sir, you get $1,500 from the defendant on your behalf. Thank you. 